I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Vidal Acheria. Uh, yeah, Vidal is a, um, is a uh, series star professor of economics, economic finance, Star School of Business in Europe University. He is basically a uh, BTEC in computer science and engineering from IIT Bombay and then PhD from PA of Star School of Business. Uh, I think uh, those who work or those who are uh, aware of the field of economics and finance in the frontier field, they all will know him. He is one of the leading experts of economics and finance in the world today. Uh, we are welcome to IIMA and, uh, and thank you for accepting for coming here and spending some time with us. It has been wonderful since morning you are meeting and I can school with some of us. Now he uh, is going to talk on his uh, work entitled Whatever It Takes, The Real Effects of Unconventional Monetary Policy. And you all will uh, like it. Uh, Great. Thanks. Thanks, Abhiman, for inviting me. I'm glad to be back here. I think I was probably here maybe three, four years back. Uh, it's nice to see the new campus uh, as well. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Tim Eisert, Christian Ufinger, and Christian Hirsch. They were all PhD students at Guther University in Frankfurt. Uh, this is just to give you a quick prelude on how this paper came about. So. Uh, some of the academics, uh, some from the US, some from Europe, uh, we, have, we were on this scientific council of a body called the European Systemic Risk Board. And this was something that has been put in place uh, since the global financial crisis of 07, 08 uh, to help ECB and the other regulators in Europe deal with systemic risk issues. Uh, there's a technical team there which kind of does a lot of the work, we were supposed to just give some high level advice on policy making. Uh, and one thing I find in uh, policy making, especially on banking crises, is that uh, things are moving at such a fast pace uh, during the crisis that uh, it, it almost becomes hard to know what is the exact diagnosis of the problem and you know, then to come up with a robust uh, set of policies to recommend. And so, uh, so I started doing this work with the PhD students at Guther University, uh, mainly because I found that uh, I felt when we were giving policy advice that we had not actually yet documented what was really going on with the banks, their lending, how the transmission of bank problems was happening to the real sector, etc. Uh, and this is a second paper in that series. In the first paper, we showed that when the sovereign debt crisis took hold in Europe in 2010 and 2011, uh, there were a set of banks that became very distressed because of the collateral damage from the government bonds uh, loss in value, especially in Spanish, Italian, Greek, Irish, and Portuguese debt. Uh, and that these banks started transmitting their problems to the real sector, effectively by engaging in a credit crunch. They were withdrawing credit from the corporate sector. And uh, what was perverse in our first uh, paper was that actually this was not a normal credit crunch. So in a normal credit crunch, the idea is that banks have been hit by losses and you know, they are trying to shrink their balance sheet, they are deleveraging, and therefore they are not lending to the corporate sector. But what we found was that it wasn't the case that the bank balance sheets were shrinking. What was really happening was that the corporate lending was shrinking. And what was going on was that whatever lending capacity banks had, they were actually punting even more on the Spanish and the Italian debt. And it basically looked like what we called as a carry trade or a gambling for resurrection sort of a motive, which is that Italian and Spanish banks in particular, they were already heavily hit in terms of capital losses on their government debt. They had very tiny slivers of equity. What do you do when you have no equity left, no skin in the game, and you can keep borrowing in, in short deposit markets, etc.? You just double up. You basically go for broke because if the bet pays off, then you would have added a lot of profit to your equity without investing any capital of your own. If things go bad, these are deposits, you know, governments will probably come and bail you out uh, in any case. So there was a crowding out, in our opinion, what was going on was really a crowding out, which is that the sovereign uh, credit excess on bank balance sheets was actually crowding out the corporate credit. And what that led the ECB to do was to undertake a series of mechanisms to say that, oh, you know, banks have been hit by this uh, 
collateral damage, why don't we stabilize the prices of these bonds? Okay, and what I'm going to try and show you is that this kind of fix the symptom uh, of the problem, which is that they, they stabilize the prices of the government bonds, but the banks were so highly leveraged to start with that their gambling for resurrection incentives didn't really go away. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating a bit. Not all banks were in this situation, but there were many banks out there that were very highly leveraged. And while a part of their assets got stabilized, their incentives to go for broke actually didn't stabilize. And what they ended up doing now was that because the government bonds were not the risky assets they could punt on anymore, they basically started punting on the riskiest corporates that they had. And so I want to highlight that the actions taken by the European Central Bank, they didn't fix the real problem, which is that the banks had very leveraged balance sheets. They should have recapitalized these banks, either asked them to privately shore up the equity capital on the right-hand side of their balance sheet, or in some cases, if that was not possible, the governments could have injected the capital. And that, that would have restored the incentives of banks not to go for broke. And I'll, I'll show you what happened. But in, in a nutshell, my sense is what's happened in Europe in the last three to four years is a little bit like the Japanese banking crisis, where you have an undercapitalized banking system that has access to cheap liquidity from the central bank. And what the banking system is doing is evergreening the bad loans rather than taking the losses. And when that happens, usually the economy stagnates because the funding is not going to the deserving firms in the economy, but it's actually going to the sick firms of the economy. Uh, investment stagnates, employment stagnates. And if a bad shock arises, like say in the most recent uh, few months with the Brexit shock, uh, then the banks uh, get get weaker and they've actually not improved in the last three years and they look uh, teetering on the verge of failure uh, even further. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of the long and short of what we find. I'll, I'll, I'll show you these things in some gory detail. Uh, because I'm in an Indian context, I think I, I want to just put, put it in perspective on what this may, might mean for India you'll see that the kind of data we have to do this evergreening analysis, we don't have this kind of data from the RBI. Maybe RBI has it internally, Abhiman probably knows, but at least we don't have it at the level of granularity that we are going to be able to do things as you'll see. Uh, but my sense is that uh, we may be in a somewhat of a similar cycle possibly with the public sector banks in India. Uh, you know, they are almost 75% of banking assets. Uh, they're uh, NPLs plus restructured assets are now more than 10% of the loan advances. And you know, a lot of people are calling for uh, lowering of interest rates uh, in the economy, saying the RBI is not internalizing the growth benefits from doing that, inflation has come down, etc. But my sense is that the worst thing you can do when you have an undercapitalized banking system is to actually give them cheap funding. This is sort of my general uh, lesson I've learned from studying banks in a variety of settings because what they'll do is that because they're getting a lot of cheap funding because the central bank is actually manipulating the rates to be low, suddenly a lot of these evergreening of loans is going to look profitable to the SIG bank because they're actually getting funds at such a low rate. They will say, let me just punt on this even further. I don't have to actually generate even as high a return as there was when interest rates were high. Uh, so my sense is what uh, RBI is trying to do, maybe with a little bit of delay than what some of us would have liked, is probably the right thing, which is to actually first clean up the banks, which they are trying to do with the asset quality review. It remains to be seen whether the pace at which the government capital comes into public sector banks will be fast enough to cover up these losses and make them well capitalized. But if, if, if I was put in place at RBI, at least based on my uh, study in other countries, my recommendation would be clean up the banks, recapitalize the banks, and then lower the interest rates rather than doing it the other way around. Uh, that sort, sort of be my recommendation. Uh, um, okay, so uh, let me jump ahead. So this whatever it takes is sort of now a very famous uh, part of a speech that Mario Draghi uh, gave on 26 July 2012. Uh, just a quick uh, backdrop of what had been happening prior to this. I'll also show you a graph. Uh, you know, in 2011, especially September 2011 onwards, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe was really at its peak. Uh, 
Uh, first ECB came out and said we are going to give a lot of liquidity. They injected more than a trillion euro of liquidity into the banking system, effectively lending to banks against all kinds of collateral that privately was actually not fetching much liquidity at all. So below market rates and uh, uh, below market haircuts uh, on the liquidity that they were supplying. But what they, what ECB found was that Somehow that wasn't enough to calm the markets and I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, say a little bit more about that. But then on 26 July, Mario Draghi came out with this sort of, uh, uh, you know, bazooka as uh, the press called it that time, which is, he said that within our mandate, uh, we stand ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. Uh, and so the backdrop was that as the Spanish and the Italian uh, bond deals were converging much, much uh, away from the German boon deals, sometimes 400, 500 basis points, people started worrying if this was the end of the euro because the whole concept of the euro was that we'll bring about convergence amongst these countries uh, and it seemed as though uh, they were just diverging uh, away from each other at, uh, at a fast pace. Um, but uh, when, you, when you see Mario Draghi's own reflections about uh, some of these policies, uh, he, he reflected later on by saying that, uh, yes, we have stabilized the financial uh, sphere to an extent, uh, but we really haven't seen much benefit of this on the real side in the economic sphere. Uh, the situation remains difficult. We did exit the recession in the second quarter of 2013, but growth momentum remains quite weak. Unemployment is only falling very slowly, and confidence in our overall economic prospects is fragile. Uh, and all this is feeding into low investment. So it seemed that uh, it did have the immediate effect of sort of stabilizing things, but it didn't produce the kind of real sector gains uh, that, that they were hoping that their actions would bring about. So I, I think we are providing one microscopic lens into why this transmission to real activity may not have happened. Uh, and our main st uh, story and message, as I said, is going to be that when you have undercapitalized banks, they just don't transmit liquidity in the right way. Uh, you know, it just, it just doesn't work. I think it hasn't, it didn't work in the Japanese banking crisis. Uh, it didn't work in Europe after 2008 because they never really recapitalized their banks. And by 2011, some banks were even more undercapitalized and it didn't happen with the transfer of liquidity in July of 2012 as well. So what, I, what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit more about the OMT announcement, then show you that it did have the immediate effect of stabilizing banks, which is that the bank creditors actually believed that whatever action the ECB committed to take is a stabilizing factor for the credit of the bank. But I'll show you that it didn't actually improve the capitalization of many of the banks in Europe, especially the banks in the periphery, uh, the Greece, uh, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and Spanish banks. So OMT is, I'm going to talk about that. So that is basically this speech. Uh, it's called the OMT speech, which is that these are outright monetary transactions. And what the ECB meant, which Mario Draghi didn't call, clarify in the July speech, but then they came out with two more speeches where they clarified this, which is that what is within our mandate is to go and do open market transactions of sovereign bonds, which central banks can always do. And effectively, what he told the market is that I'm giving you a put option, which I may not exercise right now, but if Italian and Spanish bond deals diverge too much, I stand ready to basically buy these bonds in, in open market transactions in the market. Um, uh, this program has not been activated to date. So they did ECB in after, so this speech was actually the justification for quantitative easing, where they now started a monthly program of buying sovereign debt and other kinds of assets from the market. Now they are even talking about buying corporate debt uh, of the market. But the original program, which was to buy Spanish and Italian debt under this announcement, was actually never put in place. It was a put option, a guarantee to the market that I stand ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro within my mandate. That means that if Italian and Spanish yields are widening away too much from German bonds, I'll go and purchase them in the market and prevent their prices from collapsing too much. Uh, so I'll show you that it didn't, however, for a set of banks, restore the capitalization to what one might call as uh, particularly healthy levels. Uh, 
Uh, and then I'll show you what is the impact of all this on bank lending. And perhaps the main message here is that very often we are used to thinking about bank lending outcomes in terms of aggregates. Did, is bank lending expanding? Is bank credit expanding and at what pace? Uh, and what I'll show you is that that may actually be a very bad way of thinking about quality of bank lending or desirable bank lending, especially when you have a part of your banking sector that's undercapitalized. Because it could be that the growth in bank lending is actually happening to exactly the wrong kind of firms. It may be the evergreening of loans that's actually taking place. And so you actually need to look at micro data to understand what's happening to bank loans, what kind of bank loans are getting made. And I, I think the main point here is that whatever distortions I show you in bank lending, I'm, I'm going to call it this evergreening or zombie bank lending, is all coming from undercapitalized banks. Okay, so if you want to take a macro view of looking at these statistics, whether bank loans are expanding, credit is growing, etc., all of that is fine if you have a well-capitalized banking sector. If you don't have a well-capitalized banking sector and parts of your banking sector are in trouble, they don't have enough capital, they have perverse incentives, it's not good enough to look at macro stats anymore. You have to understand who is lending to whom and what kind of firms are these. If they have if they are well-capitalized banks, I'll show you that the bank lending is actually happening to the healthy firms. And their credit growth is actually the way you would want to interpret the credit growth, which is that this is an improvement in aggregate outcomes of the economy. Uh, and finally, and importantly, this is what we were really after for the committee that some of us were on at the European Systemic Risk Board, which is, can we actually connect these bank lending outcomes to what is actually happening to the financial and the real sides of the corporate balance sheets uh, in Europe. Okay. And uh, in particular, we'll see that some argument that often gets given about evergreening or forbearance by a central bank or weak banks is that, oh, if we ask banks to take losses, credit will get cut off from these firms, these firms will be forced to delever, there'll be loss of employment, uh, you know, there'll be loss of investments that these uh, firms could have made, etc. I'm going to show you that actually the zombie lending which is done, which is this evergreening of the loans to the worst firms, these firms actually in our sample never recover. They never improve compared to the better firms in, the, in their sectors. And worse, sectors which have a high proportion of these zombie firms, which is basically, let, let me call them sort of living dead. They are sort of kept alive just by extension of generous bank credit. Uh, the sectors where the proportion of zombie firms is high actually show particularly worse uh, outcomes in terms of growth of sales, capex, employment, etc. Uh, and our explanation is going to be that basically there is just excess capacity in this sector. These bad firms should actually be exiting, making it profitable for the healthy firms to operate, make capital expenditures, maybe acquire some of the assets of these zombie firms, but that transfer doesn't take place, and even the healthy firms are actually forced to cut back their investment because the sector has excess capacity. Uh, should we save our questions for the end? Or? No, no. Uh, I'll take them along with you. Yeah, so it's not clear to me what the incentives for the banks are to lend to uh, zombie firms, which you're talking about, you know. I mean, why would they want to, because they get higher interest rates from lending to the lower uh, quality firms? Uh, no, so uh, I, so the main, the main benefit is basically that you don't have to, rec you know, no bank wants to recognize losses. So when a loan to a zombie firm is coming due, most likely it's going to default. These are typical, this will typically be loss making firms with extremely low interest coverage ratios. So when the loan is coming due, most likely it will default. If it's default, you'll have to, you'll be forced to recognize it as a loan loss. The loan loss will wipe out whatever tiny sliver of equity you have. If you wipe out that tiny sliver of equity, it may precipitate a regulatory action, the management of the board, may, management of the bank may get fired, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if you are getting punished in the market for your losses, so you're not, actu you're not actually getting much funding in the market, so, you know, market is disciplining you for the losses that you have, you would like to send a signal to the market that I'm cleaning up my bank. But if what's happening is that the central bank is coming out there and saying, forget the market, I will lend cheap liquidity to you against all kinds of questionable collateral that you have, the discipline is lost. Now the bank says, what's 
there is not too much immediate gain for me from actually recognizing these losses because I am getting the cheap funding from the central bank anyways. So let me postpone this problem. Let me just roll over this loan that has come due. Let me extend its maturity effectively by another three years. And what I'm going to show you is that how do you want to do this? You will actually pass on the entire subsidy you are getting from the central bank to these firms because this is a trouble firm. It doesn't have cash flows to repay you. So you want to actually give them really aggressive credit at an extremely low interest rate. So what I'm going to show you is something that's very hard to reconcile with normal bank lending behavior, which is that credit to the worst firms is going to be at the lowest interest rates in our sample for these undercapitalized banks. Because if you give them a high interest rate in six months time, they're going to come and default anyways. So if you really want to postpone the loan recognition by another three years or five years, as is the typical maturity in the syndicated loan market that I'm going to use, how do you do that for the full maturity? You have to actually do it at a very aggressive interest rate that you know, they will be able to meet very easily in terms of interest payments. But the real incentive is that if you have a very tiny sliver of equity capital, you want to postpone the, you want to continue the option value of equity of the bank as much as possible. Because if you take the loan loss, equity is wiped out, triggering all sorts of regulatory and you know, management actions and so on. Um, it's the same thing of why public sector banks didn't recognize NPLs. They just put, they just, they had them in the restructured assets and they kept doing it for a while. You can see that the restructured assets in the last Indian cycle seem to be taking more to come out of the CDR, the corporate debt restructuring cell than in the cycles before. And ultimately RBI said, let's do the AQR. And you know, you can see that restructured assets in the last year have come down dramatically and the NPLs have gone up because they are just recognizing the losses now. Uh, okay, let me let me skip all this. But here, the put option is from the government, lack of capital. Yeah, exactly. So in India, it's from the government. Uh, but you know, I think that it might still be that you know the management is still concerned about taking losses. You know, I, I forget the exact term that was used, but even for loan officers, there might be actions if the sectors that they had lent to. I forget what the vigilance committee or something like that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. C CVC or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, so this is loans which are going to fall back, and you want to prevent them from becoming an NP. Because once it recognizes an NP, you can't lend. You know that. Yeah, exactly. you know that. Yeah. So, <coughs> so you are basically you don't want to recognize the loss, but the only way to not recognize the loss on a defaulting loan is to, when the principal is coming due, to just roll it over for another three years. So in our data, it's going to look like you made a new loan. But that's effectively just an extension of maturity of the old loan. Uh, and you know, you can do that only if you have access to liquidity. If, the, if your liquidity in the market is actually drying up, then you can't afford to do this, at least not in the full quantity that you would like. Because the moment the market anticipates that that's what you're going to do, they're going to give you even less liquidity because they know you're going after the bad loans. But if someone, if either the central bank or the government comes and says, listen, liquidity is not a problem for you, then you have access to liquidity and you will engage in this sort of evergreening behavior. Yeah, so here you have but you don't have a run, right? You don't have a depositor discipline on the public sector banks. If anything, uh, you know, when things go bad, people put their money into public sector banks because, you know, Infosys wants to go to the newspaper and say my deposits are with State Bank of India, not with ICICI, right? So, Okay, so let me just uh, get into the program uh, so you know I can get to the more interesting zombie lending results because I think that's where the juice of the paper is. Okay, so uh, what's the backdrop of this OMT program? So the OMT program uh, in the second and third speeches Mario Draghi clarified is a commitment to buy a theoretically unlimited amount of government bonds. The central bank will just keep growing its balance sheets as they have in all these western economies with one to three years maturity in secondary markets through open market operations. Okay, and this is something that the ECB could do in its mandate because how does a central bank operate its monetary policy in the modern world? It's all done through open market operations. You are just setting the interest rate to the right level by uh, supplying or withdrawing uh, government bonds from the market and uh, providing reserves or taking out reserves in exchange for it. 
So, uh, what is the backdrop of this? So, this red line is the Draghi announcement, the July 2012, the OMT or whatever it takes speech. Uh, what I am plotting here on x axis is of course, just the calendar time and on y axis is the spread in percentage points between Spanish bonds uh, that is in the uh, red line, the dash line versus the German bonds at the 10 year maturity. So, this is the government bond spread between Spain and Germany and the blue line is the government bond spread at the 10 year maturity between Italy and Germany. Okay. So, it, it you can think about it as a measure of credit risk of Italy and Spain relative to that of Germany captured through the uh, government bond yield markets. You can also do this in the credit default swap markets uh, if you want. So, you can see here that you know as 2011 especially in the second half the sovereign debt crisis is taking hold uh, at its peak the Italian and Spanish government bond yields uh, are yielding in excess of 450, 500 basis points. Uh, over the German bonds. Okay. And then uh, this is the first action that the ECB took which was to lend to the uh, uh, banks against the government bond collateral. So, here they did not commit to buying the bonds. They said we will give you loans, uh, we, will, we will give you reserves liquidity against the collateral which, which can be the government bonds. And you can see that Temporarily, it actually brought the Italian and Spanish bond deals down relative to the German bonds, but it was not a long lived effect. By March of 2012, actually, these yields started picking up again. And part of the problem was actually that the governments were, Italian and Spanish governments were really smart about the injection of liquidity by European Central Bank. So, what they did is they realized that ECB has supplied a lot of liquidity to banks against collateral why do not we go and issue a ton of extra debt in the market? Because banks can actually just take that, supply the collateral to the ECB and we would have actually funded our debt in the market. And of course, once the program expired, the market basically realized that Spain and Italy have done this uh, and of course, the macro news were not good that time as well and the spreads actually started becoming higher again. So, ECB realized that the lender of last resort that it did this one more than 1 trillion euro which has been the largest liquidity injection as a lender of last resort ever in the history of banking by one cent single central bank uh, that had not actually stabilized the sovereign debt markets. And that prompted the ECB to come out and say, so here what happened is people started worrying about Italy and Spain possibly exiting the eurozone because they are just diverging dramatically from Germany. Uh, and so, they came out uh, and said, yeah, we will buy these unlimited bonds. They did not start buying anything. They just said, we stand ready uh, to buy these bonds. And you can see that uh, it had a very sharp immediate effect of bringing the yields down and over time actually a sustained uh, reduction in the yields. In fact, <coughs> right now because of the extremely low interest rates of ECB, the government bond yields are even at the long end are practically zero and sometimes even in the negative zone. The rates follow the same trend, uh, the overnight rates. Yeah, I have not checked that actually. I would assume. And what was this LTRO thing that they also did? Yeah, so LTRO was basically this 1 trillion euros of the lender of last resort. So, what they did is they basically gave 3 years of committed repo funding to banks against government debt collateral and therefore, even the issuance that I was talking about that Spanish and Italian and Portuguese government did, it was all up to three years of maturity because you knew that the repo will expire after three years and so the longer dated repos might not come at that attractive a price because now you are taking the risk that the central bank may or may not lend them the maturity of the funding beyond three years. So, the governments were pretty smart. They basically immediately arbitraged the provision of liquidity by the central bank by supplying even more debt into the market saying let us just take all the all of this up against our collateral. Uh, so, so we are going to study the impact of this in a variety of ways. Uh, what is our data? Uh, for bank loan data, we are going to use the Thomson Reuters deal scan data which has syndicated loans made by European banks to European firms.
A lot of firms in Europe are private. In fact, we are going to focus only on the private firms because in our first study, we showed that it's these private firms who are really dependent on banks uh, and got affected by the drying up of bank credit uh, in the period over here. So we are not going to look at publicly traded firms because we find that when the banks were crowding out the corporate sector in this phase, the publicly traded firms started issuing corporate bonds and basically they just switched to an alternative form of financing. But Europe has a lot of private firms and, and these firms were bank dependent and they were experiencing credit crunch during this period. And we're going to focus on this private sample in this paper. Uh, our sample is from 2009 to 2014. The private firms that we look at, they are intersected with the MADS data set for the corporate finance data. So what are the loans that we are looking at? These are loans issued to 980 private borrowers and we have 49 lead banks uh, from Europe in our sample. Uh, okay, so let me, uh, so basically there are four sets of results. The first uh, is to just do a simple event study kind of analysis of this OMT announcement to show you that it stabilized banks credit but the improvements in the bank's equity capitalization were not dramatically high. Uh, then I want to show you evidence on bank lending, on overall lending, uh, but then show that a lot of the credit growth that one sees in the aggregates is actually increase in zombie lending uh, out there. Then hopefully there is time to show you financial and real effects of this kind of zombie lending. Uh, and then what kind of distortions the presence of zombie firms has on the non-zombies uh, in the sectors, uh, so on the healthy firms uh, in the sector. Okay, so uh, here's an example of the way that banks benefited from the OMT program. So, so this is from the annual report of a bank. Uh, it's an Italian bank called UBI Banker. Uh, the report is at the end of 2012, so six months after the OMT. So BTP is the acronym for the government, Itali the Italian government bond. Uh, and in the report, they are basically talking about their capital position and they say that the effect of the narrowing of the BTP to boon spread generated an improvement in the market value of debt instruments. So that's basically the collapse in the bond yields. So that's going to improve the market valuation of these bonds. And what that created is that it has uh, added to our book equity with a fair value mark to market reserve of euro 855 million. Okay, now total equity of UBI in December 2012 was 8.6 billion euros. So these mark to market gains or this bonanza that ECB gave to, the, uh, to this particular bank was good 10% of its total equity. Okay, now a lot of people when they look at this, they immediately say, wow, this is, this is a great backdoor recapitalization of the banking sector. Okay, now whether the recapitalization is adequate or not is really going to depend upon how much this equity is compared to the size of the bank balance sheet. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by this. So just for sake of argument, suppose the balance sheet of UBI banker is 100 times this amount. Okay, that means it's a 100 is to 1 levered bank. Then, yeah, I have improved the equity of this bank by 10%, okay? But its leverage is still going to be very close to 50 is to 1 after this whole thing has happened. In fact, not even 50 is to 1. It's going to be 100 is to 1.1, which is going to be practically the same. So even though I have improved the equity of the bank by 10% compared to the level where it was before, if the size of the balance sheet is very massive, I wouldn't have produced a massive improvement in the capitalization of this bank when you take the full balance sheet into account. So this is a bonanza for shareholders. Yeah, they were not worth much relative to the value of the bank and they got a 10% return for doing nothing because the central bank came out and stabilized you. But if you think about whether they have enough skin in the game while running this bank, answer is no. They had 1% skin in the game before, now they have 1.1% skin in the game before. It's really not a massive improvement in the incentives of this bank not to uh, gamble for resurrection. Okay, and now I've, I've exaggerated the example, but the point is that what really matters for whether they are going to lend credit in an efficient way or not, whether they have enough skin in the game with the credit decisions that take, 
is a function not just of the gain in equity that you see, but how substantial this equity is in the balance sheet or the capitalization of the bank. Okay, and those are the numbers we want to look at. And frankly, our value in the first part of the paper is just to show those numbers because <coughs> the first part I'm going to show you, which is these kinds of announcement reactions, they've been done in other studies because this is sort of fairly quickly uh, easy to do. Okay. So what we are going to do is the following. So the European stress tests give you in June of 2012, what were the positions in the sovereign debt of different countries that each bank has. Okay, so for each bank B, uh, in some country J, I'm going to look at all of its sovereign debt holdings that were there just prior to the OMT announcement. On the OMT announcement, for each government bond that is out there, I can calculate the immediate one day price reaction in the market of these bonds. Okay? And I'm going to attribute that as the windfall gain that the OMT action transferred to the bank. Okay? So knowing the bonds that each bank is holding, I can revalue the bonds pre-OMT to post-OMT as an event study. So that tells me through the collateral benefit of improving the prices of this government debt, how much mark-to-market fair value reserve ECB created on the balance sheet of these banks. I know what's the total equity of this bank pre-OMT. So I can calculate the fraction that I was showing you for UBI Bank Hub. Okay. <coughs> so my point is that we don't have this disclosure in every single balance sheet though we have it for UBI Banker, but I'm going to simulate this mark-to-market fair value reserve by revaluing all the sovereign debt stuff that is there. Now note that the actual gain may be bigger because maybe because you revalued bonds, certain other asset classes might have also got revalued, but I'm going to focus on the sovereign bond gains. Okay, so I'm going to, and I'm going to call this as an OMT windfall gain of Bank B in country J. So, and I'm going to, for most of the study, I'm going to separate banks into non-GIPS banks. So this is, uh, as I've been saying, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and the GIPS banks. So you can see here that the windfall gain for the non-GIPS banks in, in the Eurozone is pretty small. It's just 1.1% of their starting equity. But for GIPS banks, it's more substantial. It's 8% of the starting equity. And it's not surprising because if you look at the June 2012 holdings of the troubled sovereign debt, which is the GIPS government bond holdings as a fraction of the assets, they are very tiny. They're just 1% of the balance sheet for the <coughs> non-GIPS banks, but they're almost 12% of the balance sheet for the GIPS banks. And you know, when you have a very levered balance sheet, even a small improvement in the equity is going to stabilize the debt uh, substantially. So you see that there's a 23 basis points reduction in the CDS for non-GIPS banks and a 96 basis points reduction on average uh, for the GIPS banks. Okay? But as I said, to me the interesting question about knowing whether this is going to transmit into good lending behavior or not is what does it do to the capitalization of these banks not just how much percentage change there is in the equity of these banks. Okay, so that's what I want to show you next. Any questions on any of this so far? Okay. So, uh, one, one thing, question I have. Yeah. So, instead of uh, injecting liquidity into the system, if uh, the regulator said, okay, I don't uh, want mark to mark accounting for some period of time, it's suspended. So, it could make any benefit. Uh, it could. The question is whether the market would already be pricing these assets in the market value of your equity. So, let me just give you an example. So, there's a bank in Italy that is insolvent right now. It has negative book equity. It's actually the oldest bank, Monte Paschi di Siena. And, uh, you know, they are trying to sell one of their a loan loss portfolio, which of course they have not been marking down anymore. But now because they are going to sell it in the market, it's actually, they are, they are looking at what haircut they can actually sell it. And the numbers are on the order of 30 cents on a dollar. The moment they did this, the market actually repriced all the Italian bank stocks 
because they said if Unicredit has to sell a loan loss port portfolio in the market, now I know that you know the numbers are going to be on the order of 30 cents on a dollar. Now why might market value of equity matter? Uh, it would matter because unless the bank is a state owned bank like say SBI or something like that, uh, an interbank creditor will be concerned about can you really raise equity in the market at all because that's your sign of ability to shore up the capital of the bank if the regulators cannot inject enough capital. Now why might this be relevant in the European context because you know these banks are not explicitly government owned banks like Monte Paschi, the Siena, Unicredit, UBI, Banca, etc. There might be implicit guarantees but as you all know of course the backdrop of all this is that the fiscal house of these countries is not in order. So it's not like they can just come out and use 10% of their GDP to recapitalize these banks because that's going to add debt to their uh, government balance sheets. So it's important to investors whether these banks have some private capacity to undertake recapitalizations. And actually government actions to recapitalize banks are not allowed under the EU directive because that would be seen as one country favoring its banks disproportionately compared to other banks who are actually not getting the government support from their banks. So again for that reason there is uncertainty as to whether governments can just readily step in and provide capital uh, anytime the way they want. Uh, so you know, just to be clear, you know, yes. uh, what is the objective when you said whatever it takes, uh, do whatever it takes to, to stabilize the banking system, isn't it? No, so I think I would say to be fair to Mario Draghi and ECB, I would say they probably did achieve their objective which was to prevent the collapse of the Eurozone. Yeah, so, uh, and yeah, I mean, yeah, and partly by stabilizing the banking system which is corroborated by your data. So, yes. it should have an erosion and equity yeah. capital, you got some gain. That's right. So, as I said, I, I think what I'm trying to say is not that they didn't succeed in their original objective that they had in the speech which was that we will do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. What I am really trying to explain uh, the objective of the paper is to understand why this sort of a massive put option, a massive liquidity injection didn't generate the real sector benefits that they might have expected and so in 2014 now they have had to embark on all sorts of quantitative easing etc. Yeah, so perhaps it is a little unfair to sort of describe that larger objective and I do not think we were realistically thought that this would suffice to revive the economy by reviving bank and economy and all that. Well, I think there was a recognition that the pan-European effort was needed to recapitalize the banks by creating that, you know, the, this, you know, the stability mechanism, European financial stability mechanism and so on. So this particular monetary action, uh, in all fairness, uh, you know, did not have... Yeah, but I think, uh, but, so I think, I think maybe let's take a very sort of, uh, very low standard which is that they certainly didn't come out and say that yes we are doing this to preserve the euro with the full knowledge that this is going to lead to zombie lending in the European economy because if they had anticipated that they would have probably worked harder to recapitalize the banks that are engaging in zombie lending as I am going to say. So if you, if you want let me just say that there was an unintended consequence of their intervention which they missed which has manifested in the form of zombie lending. And in Italy, frankly, the problem is so big now that the loan losses of banks are 10% of GDP. So it's like a massive number. So while they may not have necessarily targeted financial stability beyond the preservation of the Eurozone, I think I, I, would, I would say that they created the unintended consequence of actually aggravating the loan loss problem because they actually didn't rec recognize the losses and more credit actually got funneled into these firms rather than going to the healthier parts of Europe and the Italian economy. So I agree, I think in the paper we are probably a little harsher on the ECB than we should be. So why do you say it's unintended? I mean, it's very well could have been intended. There is a history in banking, we know from the Japanese banking system, we know from previous banking systems, where it has been done by central banks. So I'm sure this was a known fact that, you know, it's just that you hoped it may not happen, it's not unintended. Yeah, I think it's possible, though I think if you read a lot of the ECB discussion about the whole sovereign debt crisis, their perception was never what I'm going to show you that our banks are not well capitalized. Their perception was always that there are multiple equilibria in investors' beliefs about the 
whether the Eurozone is going to stay together or not. And signs like the Greek debt restructuring, etc., change the equilibrium to the investors believing that Italy and Spain may also leave the Eurozone. That created a knock-on effect on the balance sheet of banks. Their liquidity became tight and then that fed into the solvency problems and so on. So, I don't have it here, but if you read the ECB discussion of the sovereign debt crisis, they don't say that the real problem is that our banks are undercapitalized. Their discussion was that we have a bad panic in the market about Eurozone staying together or not. If we deal with this panic, we are going to actually eliminate the problem that we are talking about. My, my, my sense is that they did not actually anticipate that once we have taken care of preserving the Euro, that we are actually going to get zombie lending uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, at least that's my re reading of their diagnosis of the problem. And this is where we have constantly diverged with ECB, academics and ECB. ECB has always believed that the only problem is the sovereign debt. And that once we take care of sovereign debt yields, problems are going to go away. Academics had always been saying there are two problems. You have a, prob you have a weakness in your banking sector because many banks are poorly capitalized. And you also have a fiscal problem on the sovereign balance sheets. Yeah, you can take care of this, but you also need to take care of this other problem. Not only are banks poorly capitalized, but they hold a lot of the sovereign debt as well. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 but, but, but I think the fact that they are undercapitalized does the following, which is that previously they were betting on the risky sovereign debt. Once you stabilize the sovereign debt, they engaged in zombie lending as their preferred investment strategy. Because now sovereign debt was no longer giving them the high yields that they wanted. Now they are punting on the... That looks like a repeat of history. Yeah, it, it looks like, it, it, it basically looks like a Japanese banking crisis playing all over again. I totally agree, yes. So could the central bank not have tackled the problem of evergreen just by imposing certain mandates on these banks on, on the companies that you can lend should have a minimum interest of this ratio? So if you put, if the central banks had put such mandates uh, on the banks to give all these loans, would the problem of everything not be tackled efficiently? Yeah, they could have, but my sense is they didn't anticipate it, I think. They were not thinking that this would be a consequence of the liquidity we are supplying. In fact, I'm going to show you that they could have used something else, which is they could have looked at the interest rates on these loans. And l let me just jump ahead. So what I'm going to show you is that a firm that is loss making as an interest coverage ratio that's less than two is going to get an interest rate at a credit spread which is lower than the AAA rated firm in France and Germany. No, because if you give them a higher interest rate, they're just going to default in the next six months. So the only way to keep them afloat is to postpone their problem for the whole. Essentially, when you give an interest rate that low, it's just a balloon loan, right? It's just, you're just saying it, you just pay me the principal back in three years' time, which is the intended objective of pushing the loan loss as far out as possible. Yeah. Um, okay. okay, so let me just show you these capitalization numbers uh, in a couple of ways. So I'm going to use two capitalization ratios, uh, assets to equity, so that's like a book equity gearing ratio, and then Another ratio which I'm going to call as causi leverage ratio, which is uh, I'm going to replace book equity by market equity and assets is equity plus non-equity liabilities and in the assets I'm also going to replace equity by market value of equity, okay. So that's a causi leverage ratio. Uh, so this is basically just a book terms. The causi leverage ratios are going to look worse, especially for Italian banks because the market to book of Italian, uh, market to book of the GIPS banks has been less than one since 2011. It's on the order of 0.7. And this goes back to my earlier point, which is that even if you don't recognize the losses on your book terms, the market may already be pricing in that actually you have losses on your books. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to provide a few benchmarks. So as of OMT, we are going to classify banks into weakly capitalized and well capitalized GIPS banks. So above and below median capitalization based on this ratio. Uh, one comparison is what is the capitalization of the non-GIPS European banks and another benchmark is what is the capitalization of the US banks. And then I'm going to show you three time points. You can, we have the whole time series as well, which is what were these numbers at beginning of 2007? What were these numbers just pre-OMT, so June 2012? 
and what were these numbers post OMT which is December 2012, okay. So, let us focus on beginning of 2007 numbers. You can see that the weakly capitalized banks of course, by constru construction have a higher ratio than the better capitalized banks. But you can see that in 2007, it is actually the French, German and the UK banks which are actually more levered and actually exposed to the subprime crisis compared to the GIPS banks, okay. The Italian and the Spanish banks were not as levered in 2007 uh, as these non-GIPS European banks. Pre-OMT, however, this ordering has actually reversed somewhat which is that the non-GIPS uh, Eurozone banks are actually now, they have deleveraged some. Uh, whereas this weekly capitalized GIPS banks are now operating at a leverage of 25 is to 1. Okay. Uh, you can see that the US banks have undergone a deleveraging and they are at 9.25 pre OMT. And when you go to post OMT, you can see that there is some improvement in the capitalization of these banks. The leverage goes from 25 to 21, okay. But my point is that this is still a pretty high leverage. So, take for example, the condition of the US banks at this point, the US banks are levered 8 is to 1. So, these banks are almost 2 and a half times as levered uh, as these banks. Uh, the non-GIPS European banks are, uh, have a slightly improved 15.87 at this point. Now, as I said, these are book numbers. When you look at market numbers, you will see that the increase in the leverage that you see when you go to market is particularly perverse for <coughs> Uh, for, for these banks. So, the weekly capitalized GIPS banks pre OMT have a market based leverage ratio of close to 64 is to 1, okay. Which is basically if you compare these ratios, it is basically saying that the market to book is very low compared to 1, okay. So, the reason why the quasi leverage ratio is much greater than the book leverage ratio is because the market is actually discounting the equity much more significantly than the book value of assets. Now, you might say that is across board, but you can see this is not the case for the US banks. The US banks have a market leverage of 10 pre OMT and it is actually 9.25 on book terms because the market to book of US banks is very close to 1 uh, in, in, in this period, okay. And then OMT stabilizes them, but you can see that these banks are still levered 35 is to 1, 45 is to 1 on average in Europe. What are these leverage numbers? These are leverage numbers that we were talking about for Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers six months before the Lehman Brothers collapse. So, to just put things in perspective, these numbers that I am talking about are basically the kind of leverage numbers that one would be attributing to Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Yeah, yeah so what is the inference that you are drawing from this trend? I mean, so we know that in US and in non gips countries, the government were able to infuse capital and send them the banks and that was not possible for fiscal and other reasons in those countries. No, the inference that I am just drawing is that while there is an improvement in the equity of these banks post OMT, whatever backdoor recapitalization you provided to the banks in the weaker GIPS countries, their capitalizations were far worse than those in US and the core European countries. That is it. I just want to make the point that these are fairly leveraged balance sheets even after the collateral benefit that they got because of the OMT action in stabilizing the prices of government bonds. That's all, yeah. If I compare the weekly and very capitalized GIPS form, the market seems to be punishing the very capitalized form more. Which is the yeah. least yeah. ones, yeah. Actually, the weekly capitalized form, it's going from 21 is to 45. Yeah. And the very capitalized is 12 to 36. So. Yeah, maybe their market to books are even worse actually. Yeah. You know, our classification is just above and below median. So, you know, it's just that, yeah. Okay. So, the basic point here is that for all its stabilization of government bond deals, for all the collateral benefit and backdoor recapitalization that OMT provided, yeah, it's there. But the bottom line is that these are fairly levered balance sheets compared to, say, the US banks. Uh, so, the US banks have deleveraged quite substantially. Whereas these banks since 07, 08 actually have only been levering up and while there is some backdoor recapitalization, these are, they do not have as much skin in the game as far as their equity is concerned, okay. So, the question is what, what is, what are the implications of this for the lending that happens post OMT, okay. So, first I am going to show you overall lending. I will try and give you most of the paper just through graphs because I think they capture very well what the regressions are trying to do.
uh, and may, maybe maybe I'll just do that in interest of time. Okay, so here's so I'm going to show you four or five graphs that I think are very salient and important for understanding what's happening to the lending. And in some sense, what's happening to the lending is really the crux of the paper. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about the real effects as well. Okay, so what we have done here is, you know, as I told you, I calculated this measure of the windfall gain that each bank gets from the OMT. And based on that, we have divided banks into a high windfall gain bank and a low windfall gain bank. So just above median gains and below median gains. And from the numbers that I showed you, you can anticipate that banks that gained the most at the time of OMT were the banks that had most exposure to the GIPS bonds. So they were the banks that were suffering the most in the period prior to this. Okay? These were actually the distressed or the weakly capitalized banks. The blue line is the lending growth quarter to quarter of this sample of high gain banks. And the red line is the lending growth of the uh, low gain banks. So the y-axis here is the lending growth quarter to quarter. So 0.1 is a 10% improvement in the lending growth. Uh, and negative signs are lending contractions. So what you see here is basically that in the period leading up to the OMT, these distressed banks that gained the most at the time of the OMT announcement were actually engaging in a credit crunch on their corporate sector. Okay, in contrast, you can see that the lending growth of these better capitalized banks or banks that had lower holdings of the GIPS bonds uh, is actually somewhat more stable. It's not phenomenal, but uh, at least in the two quarters leading up to the OMT, the lending growth is actually uh, positive. Now you can see that uh, within two quarters after OMT, the lending of these high gain banks actually gets a massive pickup. Okay, so these banks which are getting the most bank uh, on their balance sheet in terms of windfall gains from the OMT, they are getting uh, the best access to liquidity, et cetera, because their capitalization is improving, et cetera. These are the banks which are growing their lending at a phenomenal pace. Now, if you just took an aggregate view of banking credit that growth in lending is good, okay, if that's the way you interpret the macro statistics, your interpretation of this would be that ECB really turned things around. These banks were engaging in a credit crunch what they've done is they've actually restored credit growth for these banks out there. Okay, so what I want to do is to now decompose this lending step by step into taking it to the ultimate point I want to show you that most of this lending growth is actually of the bad quality. Okay, this is evergreening of the bank loans that's taking place from these undercapitalized banks. Okay, so... <coughs> So, just as a prelude of getting into there, we actually didn't know about this FT article, but once we reached the point of finding that there was zombie lending, we said, let's check that, you know, we are not finding some smoking gun that no one in the world has identified. And so, of course, we just went on Google and we typed zombie lending Europe. And, you know, we found that Financial Times on January 8, 2013 had a whole page 9 on zombie lending in Europe. And they basically talked about this problem being chiefly focused in the peripheries of Europe rather than the core. In Spain, Ireland, Portugal, and Greece, banks have been reluctant to pull the plug on companies that it would have forced them to crystallize heavy losses. So this was the explanation I was giving to TTR that there's a lack of recognition of loan losses in this case. Okay, so how are we going to detect uh, zombie lending? So we are going to do the following. We are going to look for credit that looks super aggressive or super subsidized credit. Okay? So what is a subsidized credit? It's, it's going to be loans where we can say that interest rates are extremely advantageous compared to what this firm deserves. And we are going to take a very conservative way of saying that this is subsidized credit. Okay? So this is the methodology used for the Japanese banking crisis by Kebero, Hoshi and Kashyap. So what's the benchmark? The benchmark is that if the interest expense of a loan made to a firm is lower, so 
okay, so let me do it in two steps. So first we are going to come up with a benchmark interest rate, which is what's the cost of borrowing for the highest quality publicly traded borrower in the non-GIPS countries. So in UK, France and uh, Germany. So these are going to be AAA rated publicly traded firms. And we are going to use this interest expense as a benchmark for what should be the borrowing cost of a low interest coverage private firm in the GIPS countries. Okay, so the priors would be that they're going to have to pay a higher cost than the cost of borrowing of these firms. I mean, why not uh, benchmark it with respect to the highest quality public borrower in the relevant country? Because this would be even more conservative, right? This would be an even lower rate. So the AAA firm in Italy is going to borrow at a higher rate. So we are being super conservative by saying, let me use the interest rate that is one of the lowest interest rates for borrowing in the entire Eurozone for, as the benchmark. And we are going to use only the loans that are receiving credit at even more subsidized rate than that to call them as zombie loans. So I agree that may, perhaps we are being too conservative, but we are going to work with a very conservative definition over here. And in fact, you could even say it should really, yeah, anyway, yeah, we can do that. So, so using this benchmark rate, I'm going to classify a private firm as zombie if it meets the following criteria, okay? So it receives an interest payment after OMT or in, in, a, in any given quarter that's below the benchmark. So basically I'm going to call that as receiving subsidized credit because you're getting an interest rate that's lower than the safest uh, firms in the Eurozone. We are going to require that the firm has a low interest coverage ratio, okay? So among the private firms, it has a below median interest coverage ratio. So these are among the riskier credits. And we are going to require that the new loan that you are getting is only from banks that were already your relationship banks. So it's not the case that a new bank is actually coming in and saying, oh, you are a great credit, let me start lending to you. Okay, because the motivation of zombie lending is that there is an economic exposure for a loan loss to an existing bank and they are the one who are interested in actually renewing this loan at a low rate. Okay? Because if a new bank is coming in, maybe that's a good signal that actually they don't have an economic exposure to this firm, they are willing to take it on and maybe that's because they think this is a reviving firm rather than something that you are rolling over to be a zombie. Okay, so just to give you what, what these benchmarks are, so just focus. So we have two ways of calculating the subsidized rate. This is a standard problem in all this literature, which is that in MADS, which is the corporate finance database, I see the total interest paid by a firm, okay, on, and I see the total debt. So using MADS, I get an idea of the average interest rate that a bank is, uh, a firm is paying on its borrowings. Strictly speaking, you don't want that. You want the marginal interest rate. You want the interest rate on a new loan. But that I get only from the deal scan. What's the problem with that? In deal scan, I only have syndicated loans. They might be issuing, the public firms we are looking at might be issuing bonds. They might have non-syndicated credit as well. But I don't see the interest rates on those in the deal scan. So what we are going to do is we are going to use two benchmarks, have two batteries of tests and the results unfortunately are not affected much by all of this. So to just give you an example, the average firms, once we classify them as zombies, are borrowing at about 50 basis points below this benchmark interest rate that we have for the safest uh, borrowers in the core countries. Uh, what kind of firms are in the benchmark firms like Rio Tinto in Great Britain, uh, Hugo Boss in Germany, etc. Okay. okay, so this is the second important graph. Now we are showing, I'm going to show you the proportion of zombie lending firms in the aggregate. So first I showed you the lending growth in the aggregate. It was split by high and low quality banks, which I'm going to do very soon. But right now I'm just showing you out of the total private firms that we have that are receiving credit, how many of them get classified as zombie firms? Okay. So take any one line, these are just the two benchmarks. You can see that in the period where the sovereign debt crisis is unfolding, actually the proportion of zombie credit is coming down. Okay. And this was the sort of explanation I was giving to TTR, which is that this is the time when they are actually facing a run in the market, 
they actually have, they are facing some market discipline to actually tell the market that my balance sheet is clean. So they're actually cutting back. The credit crunch that is taking place is partly taking place in the form of refusal to renew credit on some of these zombie firms. But once the OMT announcement takes place, you can see that the zombie fraction of firms, and this is all asset weighted, so it's the zombie fraction of assets that are being lent against, goes up from under 4% by the end of 2013 to 12%. Okay, so this is the aggregate credit, uh, aggregate uh, number. And now uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things on this zombie credit that's taking place. So uh, what am I showing you here? So look at the firms that were non-zombies before OMT. So the point of this graph is that there is new zombie credit that is taking place after OMT, okay, which is that firms that were not receiving zombie credit before are now being classified as receiving zombie credit. So what is the interest rate? Uh, below the, no, not below median, below the benchmark. No, no, interest coverage is below the median, but also the interest rate on a loan that they have received in this quarter is below the benchmark and there is no new bank that is lending to them. So all those three conditions have to be met. Yeah, so I mean, you know, sort of, you know, using the word zombie, I mean, sort of, you know, sort of uh, it's, it's a bit uh, presumptive because I have to show you that these are indeed zombies. So I'm going to do that. Next, next yeah. So right now I'm just calling it zombie credit. I need to show you that these are likely also zombie firms. Yeah, I need to get to that. Absolutely, yeah. So right now, if you want, just think of this as super aggressive credit or subsidized credit, yeah. Okay, so these new firms that are getting classified as zombies, of course, post OMT, because that's the classification, their interest rates are on average about, say, 50 basis points below the AAA rated firms. What I want to show you is that prior to the OMT, these firms were borrowing at almost 50 basis points above the AAA rated firms uh, in those quarters. So effectively, the OMT is, is a reduction in the credit spread that is being charged to this firm by 100 basis points relative to the credit spread that's being charged to the AAA rated firms. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, why would you not view this as simply uh, a banker's response to the situation in which the borrower is finding himself? So there's a borrower who is sort of distressed and I don't want him to move into NPA. So I'm helping him with uh, as a, an interest rate which could help him to come out of trouble. Right? Yeah, so, so, yeah, no, that's yes, prudent and sensible. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't. In practice, I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, whether it's prudent or sensible, it depends. So the argument would be that, oh, this firm is actually not insolvent. It just has a liquidity problem. So let me ease its liquidity problem by lowering its liquidity problem. But then the evidence should be, for, for it to be called prudent and sensible response, these firms should actually recover in the next three years, for example. Because, you know, if, if it's a liquidity problem, you release the liquidity problem, they should actually recover their health to the health of these other firms out there. So I need to show you all that. Yes, but even if you should demonstrate, which I'm sure you will, that, you know, they didn't recover in the next three years, uh, that would not vitiate the uh, decision at that point in time. So I have a, you know. No, because you have, you have a portfolio, right? This is not the only firm that you can lend to. You can, in the same sector, there are firms which have better credit condition than this particular firm. So you have an option to take a loan loss on this particular firm. Most likely it will result in asset reallocation to the healthier firms in the sector. And you can actually lend to that healthier firm even to actually acquire these assets. So you could, by reallocating credit, you could actually fashion a reallocation of assets from the more leverage to the less leverage balance sheet. And the zombie credit, if you allow me to call that, is preventing that because you are actually saying, no, I want to keep the assets retained on the more levered balance sheet. I have to show you that it is more levered and everything that I'm going to do next. Basically, you're not allowing creative destruction. Exactly. You're, you're keeping these firms alive even though there are healthier firms in the sector that probably deserve credit. So I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to show you that the healthier firms are actually going to experience the opposite of this. The healthier firms are actually going to be experiencing increase in their cost of borrowing because that loan is not an attractive loan for me to make. 
because I would rather actually continue this loan because it prevents me from taking a loan loss. Whereas every dollar that I lend to a healthier firm means a less of a dollar that I can give to this firm where I have to recognize losses. So you have to compensate me for that opportunity cost of not recognizing this. No, no. On the other hand, I may be just, uh, uh, you know, I may, you know, I may be just uh, uh, you know, making the decision that the healthier firm is in a position to service my debt anyway. So I, that firm doesn't need my help. So it is not going to turn into an NPA. Whereas here, by helping out this guy, I might just prevent it from becoming an NPA. So I'm saying, you see, and the fact that three years later it didn't, things didn't work out, uh, does not invalidate these uh, decisions. You know, you're making it out to be some kind of malafide decision making on the part of the bankers concerned. I'm saying that as a banker, I could just justify both these decisions as a reasonably sensible decision for the reasons that I've given. Yeah, means I, I guess at some level you have to, you have, it has to pay off exposed, right? Means. But you know, there are other, other, you know, I mean, the economic conditions deteriorated. So many other things have happened also. So you always hope that, you know, the But that is exactly my point, that it's a hope. It's it's not an it's not an expected outcome. It's a it's it's a hope. I think there's a difference between an average expected outcome and a hope because the hope is only about seeing the upside. No, but there is a point in time, after so many years after the crisis, people did think that the next three years and all that conditions would improve, and you can validate the working and I have a forecast and all that, which of course got revised downwards subsequently. But I think there was an expectation that the long expected recovery in the global economy is going to take place. So a banker at that point in time could have made that judgment. Now if the economic conditions are going to deteriorate and the so-called low... No, but the point is that when you are renewing credit to a zombie firm, you have to factor this risk into account. Because when the... If you have a firm that is a liquidity problem, even though you think it is solvent, and the economic cycle goes against you, which firm is more likely to default on you? It is actually the illiquid firm because keeping solvency equal, it's the more illiquid firm that's going to run into a problem. So it's not the case that simply because you got over the liquidity problem in the short run, you have necessarily gotten over the economic risk of this loan altogether, right? So I'm saying it needs a little bit of a leap of faith to say that actually the economic recovery that I expect on this firm is going to be better for sure and therefore, on average, I should actually give them a lower interest rate, even though on all dimensions, they, this loan, this firm actually looks worse than other loans. Okay. Between the healthy firm and the not so healthy firm, if I judge that the healthy firm has a reasonable chance of continuing to service my debt, then this decision which you make in respect of your so-called zombie firms would be a reasonable bank, uh, banking decision. Yeah, it's a reasonable banking decision, but it's not a great decision for the society. That's all I'm saying. Because, because the benefit that the bank is getting is that I don't have to recognize a loss on this loan right away. So the gain is basically a private gain to the shareholders of this bank, which is that they get to stay afloat in the balance sheet of this bank for a longer period. No, that's an imputation that you're making, that this is the motivation. The motivation could be just that I want to nurse it back to good health. I mean, you, this is an imputation that you're making. No, but all else equal. No, TTR, the question is all else equal if I give you two balance sheets that look exactly the same in solvency terms, but one is illiquid, the other is liquid. Which one should you lend to at a lower interest rate? Well, you know, if the liquid guy is going to service my debt anyway, if I made the judgment, is sufficiently liquid, then, you know, any steps to help the relatively illiquid, illiquid guy would be justified. No, no, but there's an opportunity cost, right? Like every dollar that you give to this illiquid firm. But I don't need to give to this guy, you know, you know what is the basic motivation? You know, I have to keep my debt serviced. That is mine. I'm not trying to increase my, maximize my profit. But this is, no, but that's exactly my point, right? That all that the bank is trying to do is to ensure that it doesn't face a default. But you might want to lend from an economic standpoint to the healthier firm because that's more likely to be able to take advantage of investment opportunities because it's not actually running into illiquidity problem. What, what is an illiquid firm going to do in, on its balance sheet? It's going to preserve cash. It's going to pass up investment opportunities because it has to worry about debt service more than the more liquid firm that is out there. So all of these are going to look like hogging of economic resources simply because you are actually distressed. And you have, you have these loans to meet and you don't have the liquidity. Uh, in the medium, 
But once once you know economic conditions improve, so this will not work. So the guy the point really is is the liquidation value greater at that point of time than the expected future value for that product. Then you should liquidate. And that's what you're basically showing now. No, that no, then you should liquidate from a societal standpoint, but the bank is going to take into account. From the banking standpoint, I am looking at the probability of this loan being repaid three years now, mm -hmm. and I am looking at today's liquidation. Value. From the right of the right, right of the right of the right to. And I showed if this is higher than that. The liquid form, the liquid form uh, is, may not be constrained from pursuing growth opportunities because being liquid, it may have access to this. Resources other than mine, other than banking resources, you can access capital market or whatever. So he's going to pursue his growth opportunity. He doesn't need help from me. So in that situation, I have to take care of this guy and make sure that my balance sheet is not damaged by this guy turning into an NPA. It's a so I'm saying, so, so the fact that you know three years later it didn't Why work out. Take a socialist no, no, it's not socialist. I'm saying it's a commercial decision. No, I, no, I, no. I think the difference is that you are assuming that the only thing you can do with the one dollar of credit. Is, is to give to that particular firm. But I'm saying no, there's an opportunity cost, which is that you can actually lend an extra dollar to this other firm that you have and get repaid with a greater certainty. And that loan doesn't have incurred this calculation at all of whether you need to do an expected return versus, so you are saying you can charge them even a higher interest rate. So you can actually make them that full extra one dollar at the same interest rate at a higher interest rate than you are trying to make up over here by giving them this subsidy. Yeah, so what is the expected value to the bank, you know, assigning probabilities to both? What is the expected value to the bank is what you have to see. So supposing the liquid fellow to whom you lend, so he returns and all that. This guy goes completely bad. So what is the expected value to the bank overall? It may well be that the expected value is greater when you are not lending that much to the liquid guy and you are supporting the illiquid guy. No, so I'm going to show you exactly that, which is that precisely because I have to give an interest rate subsidy here to compensate me for the fact that I'm actually taking some risk here of not liquidating this right away. The other firm actually has to pay me a higher interest rate. So I'm going to show you exactly that later on when I do that. My point is that there has to be a scenario in which these firms are at least catching up over the next three years. Now you are saying that's just bad luck that this is just a one draw of the thing. So if you want, then you take and take the benign interpretation that the lending choices that these banks made have turned out to be very bad exposed. Yeah, I think that's fine. But I'm going to show you later on that the fraction of firms, the, the sectors in which the fraction of such firms is very large, the economic activity of these healthy firms is actually very constrained. So the main cost of zombie firms is actually that because you are keeping these firms alive, actually these firms are actually not able to engage much. And I'm going to show you that these firms are not improving their economic activity either. But anyway, let's, let's come back to this. Uh, okay, so uh, just to give you a sense of where the zombie firms are, uh, Spain and Italy as consistent with that uh, economic times uh, FT piece, uh, you get 20% of the firms as being zombies. In other countries, it's less than uh, 10%. Okay, so here's one interesting comparison. So what are these firms? These are high quality firms uh, balance sheet characteristics. Uh, these are also low interest coverage firms. So below median interest coverage firms, non-zombie firms. So these firms are not receiving super aggressive credit. And these are the zombie firms that are receiving super aggressive credit. Okay, and this is the difference between the non-zombie and the zombie. So as you can see here, the interest coverage for the non-zombie is 1.2, for the zombie firms it's 0.4. So this is consistent with them having actually a greater liquidity problem. But you can see that even on solvency criteria actually they are worse. So this firm has a net worth of 17%, uh, the zombies on average have a net worth of 11%. Profitability of non-zombies is 6.4%, the profitability of zombies is 3.5%. The leverage of uh, non-zombies is 58%. The profitability of zombies uh, is 62.5%. So uh, one point is that it's not actually the case that the zombie firms are comparable to the non-zombies on solvency criteria. And they are just worse on the liquidity criteria. They're actually worse even on the solvency criteria. At, point At that point in time, yes. Um, okay. So... Now this is the 
uh, next two are I think again sort of important one, but I think this one is probably the most important which is that what is happening to zombie lending now if I partition them based on the capitalization of banks. Okay? Now this argument that you just gave that it is actually efficient for the bank to not liquidate some assets and look for the recovery value. If I understand that argument right, it is about what is efficient for the bank to do as a whole. Okay? Now that argument should apply to a better capitalized bank as well as to a worse capitalized bank. But what I am going to show you is that what seems to be driving the decision to do zombie lending is whether I have to take an immediate loss by liquidating the assets because a better capitalized bank is actually do, going to behave in a very different way than an undercapitalized bank. Okay? And this is where I am going to, I'm going to use this to make the point that it is the tension between the shareholders of the bank and bank value which is driving zombie lending rather than zombie lending being the efficient thing to do for banks as a whole. Okay, so let me. Yeah, but you know, I would say that the efficient outcomes could be different for the better capitalized bank and for the undercapitalized bank. So the same decision need not be efficient for both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I have to rush. But it's okay. I, th I think let me focus on this graph because I think this is the main one. So. So what you see here is these are the undercapitalized banks, these are the better capitalized banks and this is how the fraction of zombie firms is evolving over time. Okay? So what you see is that prior to the OMT, it is the case that the undercapitalized banks have a slightly greater zombie fraction but the trends are very parallel. It is not like there is a substantial uh, evolution of this. But what you see post ECB intervention is that the zombie lending picks up in the undercapitalized banks and it comes down dramatically on the, uh, on the well capitalized banks. So not only do you need that this decision has to be different, the decision has to change with OMT. That the attractiveness of doing zombie lending between undercapitalized and the better capitalized banks, it has to actually change with the ECB's action. So now you need to give me like another round of layer of counter counter argument on top of that. But our point is that basically the undercapitalized banks now got cheap liquidity so suddenly they are now engaging in avoiding the losses at all costs. They are not facing market discipline anymore. So you're saying why are the responses Yeah, this, this is basically our main, main graph which is that whatever incentives are there to do zombie lending, they seem fairly constant in the, when the market forces are at play. But once ECB gives cheap lending to all banks regardless of their condition, you basically now get a divergence in zombie lending. So our point is that absent market discipline or in presence of market discipline, banks are actually making the efficient decision as far as zombie lending is concerned. These trends are very parallel. But once you give cheap liquidity to all banks, regardless of their credit quality, you basically get that the zombie lending takes up in the undercapitalized banks. So this was the point I was trying to make right at the beginning that you don't want to give lower interest rates when you have public sector banks that are undercapitalized. Um, okay, so I think uh, what I'll do is, uh, I think I'm out of time. So let me just give one concrete example because I think I, I want you to think about uh, this in, when you go to the airport, look for this firm, okay? So uh, United Colors of Benetton, you know, most Indian airports, there is a thing. They are doing massive sales everywhere, okay? And I had not, registered why they are doing this until I, I saw this example. So Benetton, uh, you know, had been losing its market share to Zara and like over a good 10 year period. Uh, in 2012, FT basically talks about, uh, you know, them having uh, very poor debt servicing ability. So two things happen. Uh, in 2012, a loan is actually coming due in the second half of 2012 and they receive a new loan from Unicredit and the interest coverage ratio at that point is minus 0.4, so they're actually making losses at that point. The interest rate was 1.7% on this new loan uh, when the benchmark rate was 1.9%. Okay, so they're getting 20 basis point subsidy relative to the AAA rated firm's cost. On the pre-OMT pre loan, the company was paying 3.9% when the benchmark rate was 2.3%. Okay, so from a credit spread of 160 basis points, uh, they have a 20 basis points reduction in cost. Uh, 
uh, what are, what is happening in the textile industry right now, at least in the space where Benetton is a competitor, is that Benetton is basically getting the got the cheapest fund financing. What are they doing? They are basically doing sales of their inventory left, right, and center in the market to capture market share. So what is what is that doing to Zara and others? They are also having to engage in sales, etc., at a massive pace. Now, of course, this means that profitability of all of these firms is coming down and they actually don't have capacity to invest, et cetera, any further. Okay, so I think I should probably stop there. Maybe let me just say this one last thing. So what you see here is that, um, so this is TTR's point, which is that did they really recover in performance? Was this just a liquidity problem and they got back? So what you see here, these are all the OMT lines, the green lines, uh, the vertical lines. The green lines are the investment performance, capex, here employment growth and ROA for the zombie firms. The red line is the non-zombie but distressed firms, so they also have low interest coverage ratio. And the blue line is the healthiest firms out there. And what you see is that basically they are never really catching up with these other firms, either in terms of investments, employment growth or the return on assets. They are always uh, underperforming the sector. Yeah, but they're never catching up. Okay, so let me stop there. I think uh, I don't have time to show you the rest of the analysis. Uh, uh, just maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just show this as the last graph, which is, did this all pay out uh, for these banks? So TTR's argument was that maybe for these um, undercapitalized banks, they, they would have reduced their loan losses by actually doing the zombie lending. What you see is that their loan losses have actually just been uh, peaking up uh, all through and now in 2015, this is where the loan losses are now 17% of the assets uh, for these banks. Okay, so let me stop there. My sense is this is a repeat of the Japanese uh, zombie lending crisis playing out in Europe. Look out for Italian banks in the next six months. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Vidal. Actually, just before coming uh, for the talk, he was feeling a bit sleepy because of jet lag and other stuff. He just said, you know, I need to talk. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to sleep. It's, so, it's, it's, it's easy to sleep when you're on the other so, side. And then he you knows that uh, he's the best person to talk on banking and corporate at, at one go, at one way. So, so I'm uh, really thankful to Vidal for spending some time and giving a wonderful talk here. Uh, because of some time constraint, I have to stop you. Not for any other thing, you also have a yeah, I have a friend, so, so, yeah, thanks so for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.